This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Stay tuned to the end of the video for more information. <sighs> Saints Row. I love projects like this, ones where I'm kind of stumped on where to begin my script. As of recording this, I've not even written it because I'm not really sure what my angle is. I've seen a whole lot of thing bad on Twitter just for the sake of thing bad and while I agree to an extent, the thing is bad, I feel like there's a lot more depth to it than that. It's a bit more of a complex situation and I feel like it's worthy of a, some sort of analysis or critique. You see, the thing is, the game's not wholly bad. I'm not ashamed to say I did have fun with it at points. The thing is, this game really fundamentally hates Saints Row. I think that's our title. All right, let's do this. Last year, I made a big retrospective on the Saints Row franchise leading into the reboot. It was well received, people enjoyed it thoroughly, and I thank you for that really kind response, I really do. Saints Row is a series that I have a deep love for, despite the rocky nature of it, and being able to share that with so many people was an absolute pleasure. Except for you, okay? You get a fucking time out. You may already have seen that video, you might not have. I'll link it below if you care. But I think for a video like this, I have to establish how I feel personally about Saints Row. I can't make a video talking about how the new one entirely tried to erase what made it popular to begin with if I don't actually give you a marker by which I measure franchise identity. Saints Row is complicated. It's a franchise that shifted as quickly as it was created. It never properly landed on a core identity. It sort of drifted from thing to thing, and so because of that, it has a lot of different segmented fan bases. I mean, the comments from my retrospective perspective are testament to that. There are people who will swear the only good one is the first one, there are people who believe 2 built on 1 and is the peak, people who think that Saints Row 3 is when it finally got good and was made modern, and some people who've only played 4 and get out of hell for the superpowers, and I'm sure there are people who have only played the newest entry as well. And with an entirely fragmented identity like that, how do you even begin to make an argument for what a franchise should be? Well, what I would usually do when a franchise is so completely disjointed and void of identity is point to the original. That is the original vision for the franchise. Sequels that build on that continue to be part of the original vision and identity. But once you deviate in meaningful and significant ways, when characters start to act differently, when your tone shifts, and when your fundamental gameplay loop seems to focus on entirely different ideas, that's when it becomes something else. At the first sign of that, I would say identity is lost. When you look at Assassin's Creed, yeah I know, look at lasers, can't go a video without mentioning Assassin's Creed. <laughs> Fuck off. Assassin's Creed didn't go from Assassin's Creed 2 to Assassin's Creed Odyssey overnight. That would have been an obvious loss of identity to anybody with a functioning brain. I mean, it still should be obvious regardless, but for the sake of argument. The fact it slowly went through the Ezio trilogy to AC3 to 4 to Unity to Syndicate to Origins to Odyssey was a slow and methodical loss of identity, where each entry watered down, removed, and simplified elements until it became something completely different. Not an evolution like these videos with millions of views would have you believe. It's like the ship of Theseus, but Assassin's Creed. I believe pretty strongly that Assassin's Creed 3 was the turning point. Well, if we're being critical, it was like mid-Brotherhood, because that's when Patrice Desilets, the father of Assassin's Creed, was kicked out of Ubisoft for very complicated reasons, but back on track. Assassin's Creed 3 isn't a huge and obvious deviation, but upon analysis, I think it's the first real time you saw a focus on very different core themes and ideas. That slowly paved the way for bigger changes. The focus became history over the Assassin Templar story. The modern day went from a mystery, puzzle-solving experience to an action-adventure one. The lore became muddled and messy and stopped making as much sense as it had before. Connor and his story had very little to no actual connection to Desmond save for his MacGuffin key. It's also an entry where the controls changed, the focus of stealth was different, the combat focus shifted, all tiny things that while they don't detract from the overall product that make it 100% not Assassin's Creed, they detract enough for me to say this was the point for me where it started down a path that led to Odyssey and beyond. There you go chaps, that's your fucking AC3 retrospective, that's all you're getting. For Saints Row, I believe Saints Row 3 is that point, a point where the fundamental focus, tone, ideas and design philosophy shifted away from what Saints Row 1 and 2 did and decided it had to be something else. It widened its target audience to be as accommodating as possible and in doing so lost the core audience that fell in love with the original 2, for the most part. And they never stopped running. 
But then let's look at that. For me, how did Saints Row 1 and 2 do something that Saints Row 3 didn't, and why is that important to the reboot? The whole point of Saints Row from the start was to be a gang warfare sim, that's what they called it in development, and while I don't think Saints Row fell into the contemporary or modern definition of the genre simulator, you can understand what they meant by that. In Saints Row 1, you start out as just a guy, down on his luck, who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. You get initiated into one of the gangs, the Saints, and from there you work your way up. You learn what the Saints stand for, who they are, and you make your way to the top slowly dominating the city and on your way up getting faster cars, flashier clothes, nicer apartments and cool perks. It's a simple experience but an authentic one. It doesn't try too hard, it just does what it set out to do and it does that well. It grounds you in an exaggerated display of gang warfare but it grounds you because it takes itself seriously. Sure, sometimes things can get outlandish, there's some ridiculous missions involving rocket launchers, building equipment, the characters can be so nonchalant about the whole thing but what always worked and always grounded us in the story was that they all took it seriously. They were passionate about their gang, they often had personal stakes and they showed us as the protagonist what we were fighting for. Whether that was Julius, Dex, Troy or Johnny Gat, and throwing jokes in there or the over the top scenarios didn't suddenly make it a silly game or a joke game, the thing still took itself seriously and that's what made Saints Row so special. I'm gonna skull fuck that bitch. When you look to the sequel, it did everything but more. All the funny shit, all the jokes, the ridiculousness, there's more of it. But all the melodrama, the gang warfare, the character moments, there's more of that too. The world you're in is silly, the situations you find yourself in are often bonkers, but the characters aren't self-aware, they're grounded in the universe and they take it seriously. That's what makes the humour of the first two games work. The sword fight with the Ronin wouldn't be half as great of a set piece if the boss was ultra self-aware that he was doing crazy and ridiculous shit, pointing out how wacky everything is. That would detract from everything. Is storming a dock full of ships burning to the ground in search of a gang leader to fight with a katana absolutely ridiculous? Yes. But the boss makes you believe it. When he finds Kazuo Okuji, the boss humiliates him, makes him look a fool, and the boss looks triumphant. Did you really think you could match my skill? No. <laughs> I'm gonna cheat. Finish it. Hey Wong, I want you to hear something. Come on, be a good sport. You hear that, Wong? You're welcome. Thanks. When I escape, the world will not be big enough for you to hide in. Luckily for me, you're gonna burn to death in a few minutes. Your son never should have fucked with my friends. This scene doesn't play it for laughs, it doesn't make the boss look stupid, it doesn't point out the very obvious absurdity of the scene, it indulges in it. The jokes come from the charisma of the character, not from a uh, silly thing happened. Saints Row 2, in a lot of ways, is the closest a video game has come to being something like a Quentin Tarantino film. Pulp Fiction, Django Unchained, Kill Bill, and so many others are movies that are absurd. They're absolutely ludicrous, but the films indulge in that. They don't sit there and point out the absurdity with a false sense of profound self-awareness under a thin veil of comedy. They use the absurdity to build their own serious narrative from, and the humour often just finds itself. This is what Saints Row 1 and 2 both did, and Saints Row 2 more than ever. The utter balance of humour and sincerity, and above all, depth. I'm curious if you can keep your cavalier attitude when 2,000 volts are running through your body. Oh yeah? And I'm curious if you can keep acting like a douchebag when I shove that gavel up your ass. Drop it. And where were you planning on having this little meeting? No. A saint's used to own still water. And it seems like the only motherfuckers that remember that is me and Gat. I think it's time we give those other crews a wake-up call. Do you know how the sons of Samdi are still moving product after we torch their farm and drug labs? No. Then shut the fuck up. You think that 
will stop me. <coughs> For fuck's sake, die! <coughs> Last words. Go to hell. Sorry, didn't catch that. Go to hell. That wasn't very nice. Daddy, I just bought that table. Sorry about that. Jeez. No. Kill me, but don't do this. That fucker's still screaming. Oh, I'm pretty sure Shagai's dead by now. I can dream, right? They're dead, and you have the Saints' number one fan running all- If it wasn't for me, you would have died on that street corner. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't have been in a goddamn coma. But I guess that makes us even. Not really. This is Saints Row. It glorifies the protagonist and the gang of the Saints. Not as heroes, not as the good guys, they're still criminals, they're bad people you never want to meet, but it glorifies them as powerful, as ambitious, as triumphant against the other low lives of the city, and that grants them our respect. Because as the game takes them seriously, so do we, and in doing so, you create an absurdist story that is hilarious and engaging in equal measure. Saints Row 1 and 2 were not silly games, they were not joke games, they were engaging games with interesting characters, depth to their world and story, that were also absurd in scope and game design. So I think that establishes what I personally feel the point of Saints Row is, the things most people look for when they say, ah, oh, that just doesn't feel like Saints Row. You might be wondering then what I think of Saints Row 3, and I could go on here and critique Saints Row 3 and explain why I feel that game specifically doesn't stick the landing at all, but for many of the same reasons that I would critique Saints Row 3, I'm going to critique the reboot, because in my eyes, Saints Row 3 and the reboot share a lot of similarities. But if you do want to hear my thoughts on Saints Row 3 before moving on, I do actually break down exactly why I'm not in love with the game during the Saints Row 3 portion of my Saints Row retrospective linked in the description. So. It, it's there if you're interested. With all the cards laid out then, I think it's time we talk about the obvious here. Why does Saints Row hate Saints Row? It's just, look, it's gone too far at this point. And let's just hope that they can, you know, they can they can sort out Saints Row with whatever they do with the next game, uh, maybe. I mean, I don't know how you're come, ever going to come back from making something like this, but, um, you know, you, you, can, you can hope. You can hope. Make Saints Row great again is my motto. If Saints Row is supposed to be a gang simulator, then first and foremost, it needs to present the player that fantasy. Being part of a criminal operation, leading, taking over the city, eliminating the competition, ruthlessly and without remorse. The Saints Row reboot does elements of this wonderfully, but also most of it terribly. Santo Eleso is your playground in this game and serves as the city which births the Third Street Saints. Yes, there is still a Third Street, although there is no Saints Row. The ending also has a line mentioning Stillwater, suggesting the original city exists in this universe too, which begs the question, does Stillwater's geography remain intact? Is there another Third Street out there in a Saints Row district of this universe's Stillwater? I'm, I'm probably considering it more than the devs ever did. The mention of Stillwater in reality acts as a half-hearted reference to better days. Santo Eliso, however, is the closest they've come to recreating what made Stillwater work as a, an environment. Which isn't high praise, considering that since Stillwater they've made Steelport, a virtual Steelport, and literally hell. Arkham's Razor. It still finds itself with flaws though. It's like they took what made Stillwater work design-wise and then looked at the character of it all and scrubbed it clean and pasted over it. Rim Jobs is now Jim Robs and Freckle Bitches is now FBs. It acts to make the world feel sanitized, which is something we'll be talking about later on, don't worry. The city is varied with plenty of different districts, none of which outstay their welcome from the city centre to the more suburban environments, the Badlands region, the casinos and plenty more, so driving around the city never feels boring. 
Environmentally, it's graphically quite stunning most of the time, and it doesn't ever feel quite too big, unless you're tasked with crossing it in one drive, in which case things can start to feel tedious, as the world offers nothing of note to sink your teeth into outside of obviously marked activities and collectibles. But none of that is directly important for what I'm talking about in this video. In Saints Row and Saints Row 2, the city of Stillwater was a playground, not somewhere to necessarily get immersed in and lose yourself, like a Red Dead Redemption 2 or a Skyrim, it was a backdrop. Varied regions, interesting pedestrians, and plenty of wacky activities to sink your time into for rewards and to see the more strange side of the city. And Santo Aliso's motto is just that, keep it strange, which is a sentiment that utterly plagues the design philosophy of the Saints Row reboot. The strengths of Saints Row lie in the open world gameplay structure. If you ignore the context, which believe me, we will talk about, you can find joy in this game from the perspective of a Saints Row fan. I know I did, but exactly how do they manage that? Well, with the venture system. Upon forming your gang in the church hideout on 3rd Street, you're granted the Empire Building map. From here, using your money, you can place down criminal ventures from running insurance fraud to high-tech weapons research, clothing stores, and waste disposal. You choose where it goes and which you put your time into. In doing so, you slowly expand your grasp on the city. You'll see more saints patrolling the streets, and over time, by completing threats and clearing out the previous gangs, you'll begin to see less of the gangs who had a claim to the district to begin with, allowing you a slow and somewhat methodical expanse of the gang and domination of the city. But this only really stands from a gameplay perspective, when you almost imagine your own context, because honestly, the venture system feels entirely separate, entirely disconnected from our characters and the main story at hand, which is why it's so much fun. It's not bogged down by most of the pathetic dialogue and empty character writing. It's not burdened by the poor structuring of the main missions. It's allowed to flourish as something you are active in achieving. Where Saints Row 1 and 2 made the main story about taking over the city, the new Saints Row makes it side content. The main story has near to nothing to do with the venture system, and it acts only as a way to sometimes gate main missions, but it honestly never really comes up. And it doesn't feel like the characters really want to dominate the city. They feel entirely passive. But back on the gameplay front, if you do disconnect and enjoy purely the open world contents, you do feel like the leader of a gang, slowly building businesses and investing time into those. In Saints Row and Saints Row 2, you'd have to gain more respect points before you could move on to main missions. It acted as a way to encourage the player to seek out activities in the world, to essentially undertake other criminal ventures from running drugs to escort missions. Like, literally escort missions, fuck I love Saints Row, and in doing so you'd be able to get back to the main missions of taking over the city through each of the gang's arcs. Now, the structure of the new Saints Row, I honestly think is a kind of clever. It combines the city takeover and venture systems with these classic Saints Row side activities. So each venture you place down has a set amount of venture missions which are based on the classic side activities, things like insurance fraud, mayhem, or vehicle repossession. In completing these, it doesn't only tighten your grip on the district, but it'll increase your hourly revenue, and seeing that number climb in your bank account is incredibly satisfying. Coming from nothing, making money, placing ventures, completing activities that are the heart of Saints Row's madness, and then investing more money into more places to make more money to buy things in a system that screams Saints Row, it's what Saints Row 3 should have been, the perfect evolution of Saints Row 2, and with that alone, I had fun. I could create my own narrative, decide who I was, play as if I were the leader of a gang, genuinely out to win the city and dominate the criminal underworld. But this is sadly the game's only real strength. It has fine shooting mechanics, fine driving mechanics for what Saints Row is. They've always had an arcadey feel using visceral violence as a means to have fun, and this game does that. The cars are fast, handling is snappy, and drifting is easy. You smash other vehicles out of the way, and they empower you. People have been complaining online that the driving sucks compared to Grand Theft Auto, and yeah, if you're looking for realism, but Saints Row was never realism. It was never a problem in Saints Row 2, and I find that a false criticism. There's brilliant customization, whether for clothes, cars, or weapons, and manages to make general progression through skills satisfying, and also earned by incorporating challenges as a means to obtain them. All of that is solid, but I cannot shake the feeling that it hates itself for it. It pushes the gameplay, which they've made to feel like a Saints Row experience, off to the sidelines. Something that they don't focus on, and it feels like they exist for the player, not for the character. Whereas in Saints Row 1, the focus was directly to make everything matter. Design director Christopher Stockman said specifically, the team wanted to synthesize game mechanics together to make the missions, activities, and customization options work in tandem. The whole thing was one complete package. 
The characters informed what you did, the activities informed the characters, and the missions informed character growth and the expansion of activities which cycles back around. It works together, the same applies to Saints Row 2. In the new Saints Row, the ventures, city takeover and activities all work in tandem together, but the main missions, the characters, the storytelling, the saints feel completely disconnected. It's like you're playing two completely different games. And it stems from the fact that with the new Saints Row, the writing team and clearly management seems to absolutely hate Saints Row thematically. Taking over a city, killing, leading a gang, the fantasy is fun for the player, but they don't like it when they have to make the characters also strive for that too. And so the writing leaves us at a huge disconnect between gameplay and story in a way that shatters the experience, almost as bad as the bugs shatter the experience. I had so many issues with this game, and I'm sure there are people who will say, I had no bugs at all. And you're a stone-faced fucking liar, aren't you? You talk to your mother with that mouth, you fucking liar. In one three-hour play session, my game crashed 12 times. 12 fucking times. Are you kidding me? Not to mention the bugs that plagued plenty of the actual playtime itself. The style app was broken so often it caused me to have to reboot the game harder than when Volition rebooted the franchise, but a haters gonna hate, am I right? Enemies would spawn in areas I couldn't reach, wheels would be missing, the camera would often zoom to ridiculous distances when in a helicopter, and there was a whole area of the map I just couldn't enter because it would freeze me on the spot. The only way to escape was to reboot. Some of the bugs I will give credit to, however. They made me laugh often more than the actual writing of the game. You think you could fire me? My family built this business! My name is on the goddamn building! <laughs> Which, while actually a terrible outcome for Volition, was incredibly entertaining for me. They've been working on hot fixes, so props to them there, but this game needed a long time more in the oven before it released, and it's just not good enough for the money you're charging people. The most frustrating part of Saints Row is that there is a decent game in here. Under the bugs, the empire building mechanic and concept of slowly working to dominate a city is pretty well done. It's just the tone, the characters, and the actual writing and narrative is so fucking bad. I can't help but think every time I see the main characters together, these are the exact losers that the Saints Row 2 gang would walk all over. I just don't feel Volition has ever managed to truly understand what made the Saints so engaging as a gang post Saints Row 2 or maybe they understand perfectly and they're actively avoiding it. The main cast in the new game will have these moments where I'm like, okay, I kind of vibe with them. I wrote the fine print myself. Then one of them will take a selfie and ask which hashtags to use and I fucking audibly sigh. Ooh, I'm gonna post about it. Yada yada da, yada da da. Hashtag take me to church, hashtag new digs who this, hashtag and post it. It's shit like this and their really cat-handed critique of capitalism that does it. Hey man, if you want a $300 waffle maker, you can buy it with the exposure the idols pay you in. Don't expect us to chip in. I've told you before, the idols are trying to build a post-capitalist society where money is not a concept. I'm not one of these people who hates politics in games. I think media is inherently political, especially if it wants to have some sort of deeper meaning narratively that you can actually apply to the world. And to be fair, what better place to critique capitalism than in a game where a group takes full advantage of it for their own gain? Now I'm not anti-capitalist, hot take, but I think capitalism is kind of fun. It's not totally fair, and yeah, society needs some real change fundamentally to help people at the bottom not be living in complete squalor because capitalism should be a viable means for all to live, not working to simply live and get by, but working to earn. I'm not a well-versed politician, that's just my incredibly vague and summarised take that could easily change in six months, but it's entirely relevant to this video and I digress. This is a game where you can mock giant corporations, guys in suits like Dane Vogel and Ultor. It can be done and it can be done well. It's just, this game executes it fucking abysmally. The characters are treated at points like a mouthpiece for the devs. The saints shouldn't be socialists, they should be manipulating capitalism purely for selfish reasons. The game can make a point to critique capitalism, the characters shouldn't though, and they certainly shouldn't be portrayed like heroes. What made Saints Row so fun in the first and second games is that it was the fantasy of being a criminal, being a bad person, doing things in a world where it didn't matter because there weren't any real consequences. You could fuck up the cops with Johnny Gat, you could deal in drugs, act as a fake cop and kill innocent people in crude ways for monetary gain. And even simple things like robbing stores, which this game doesn't even let you do, because how can you portray the saints as the good guys when the game actively lets you shit on the little guys? This is really not a big deal. 
We just knock off a payday loan place. No one gives a shit if people rob those bastards. One guard out front and the owner at the till. He's a real scuzzbag. I want some kick a dog. So, you know, fuck that guy. I, I don't have much- We don't want your money, just his. Get out of here. The Saints were never the heroes or the good guys, they were just the ones whose side you were on. They were as bad as all the other gangs, maybe worse, which is why they always won. It was that power fantasy, that host of morally awful people that made it so damn fun, indulging in something you probably shouldn't be. The main cast of the Saints Row reboot are a bunch of seemingly morally superior, abnormally boring, pathetic fucking losers, and that's putting it mildly. Before we go any further, let me say I went with a female boss and I picked the English accents. I'm English. You can probably tell because you, you can hear my voice. I always went with the Cockney accent in Saints Row 2 through to 4 and sadly they didn't fucking include it in this game so I had to go with the female boss to get as close as I could to what I used to create in the old games. I did try out some other voices though, male and female, and they're all delivered in similar ways which leads me to believe it was no individual voice that led to the outcome that I had. Each were directed to act in a specific way, with less authority, more passive, totally sensitive, the complete opposite of the boss in Saints Row 2. Shandy, you got the sons of Sandy. It's gotta be them. Fuck you, say. Nina's down. Kev's down. Snickerdoodle is definitely down. There are very, very rare moments where the game seems to do anything close to serviceable with them. So few that I can point out every single one to you right now. No! One. I wrote the fine print myself. Two. Three. Four. Oh, th that's it? Fuck me. These are the only four moments in the whole game where I felt we were doing something close to Saints Row, and the last one isn't even the main character doing it. Plus, even then, they're not that great of examples, are they? Especially being built on the wet mound of sand that is the foundation of this game's character writing. Let's draw some direct comparisons to really illustrate my point here. In Saints Row 2, what are the boss's motivations? Well, after escaping with Carlos from the prison, we get this scene where we find out Ultor took over the row. The Saints scattered, Julius is missing, Troy is chief of police, and Dex is just gone. The boss is instantly characterized as someone who found meaning in the Saints. The people that took them in when they needed purpose, taught them how to work for something, and gave them a sense of camaraderie. That is your introduction, a deep loyalty to the Saints and a want to build them up again. We're fucking over these other gangs, we're fucking up Ultor, nobody gets to take our city, it belongs to the Saints. What's our motivation in the Saints Row reboot? I don't have to love it, I have to pay my student loans. Fuck me, fuck me. I cannot tell if they think they're being relatable and this is a meaningful story or if it's just a fucking joke. I can't tell, it's a mess. The dialogue is all like this as well. That yacht's guarded AF. Dude, did you just say AF? Yeah, it's an abbreviation. First, we fucking swear all the time. Second, it's only an abbreviation when texting. AF, as fuck, same number of syllables. Okay, fine. This is gonna be an epic statement because that yacht is guarded as fuck. And every bleeding one of them is going to learn what happens when you try to blow up a saint. Hells yeah! I am picturing the person who wrote this coming to mind, and it's one of the Discord mods from a fucking Beluga video. <laughs> Nobody talks like this. Nobody. It feels like dialogue ripped straight out of Life is Strange, and in Life is Strange, the odd and quirky dialogue is endearing because the game knows what it is. It's an exaggerated slice of life for teenagers. Saints Row characters shouldn't be talking like this. It's embarrassing. They are adult children. He was a nice guy. Sad to see him go. He carved out Sergio's heart. Okay. He was an intense guy. Sad to see him go. <laughs> it feels like a bunch of old blokes in suits sat around trying to figure out how the young people speak. Oh, look at this completely unrelated piece of footage on the screen. Amongst all of this dialogue, we never actually seem to learn much of note about our core cast, nor do they seem to feel natural together. It feels like when you see woke Twitter users conversing in such a robotic way as to not offend each other or accidentally commit the irredeemable act of a microaggression, it works only to create this aura of cringe and overall embarrassment. 
it's trying almost too hard to be sensitive, and for a series like Saints Row that was built on being pretty insensitive, you've got to ask the question, why did they make this game? They've decided to take Saints Row and, like I said before, completely and totally sanitize it beyond narrative recognition. If you hate your own franchise's history this much, if you hate the themes, the tone, the writing, the characters, the fantasy of it, why did you make this game? Which is another key aspect of the characters in this game. They all act as ways to detract from the original games, in ways that feel insulting to our investment and intelligence. When they're looking for a hideout, they're initially dismissive about Third Street. Where is this church? Up on Third. Oh, that place. When they were going on a team bonding trip, Eli says how they thought they were going to use the fleur for their matching hats, and the response to it is this. I thought we agreed to use the fleur. This is better. I'm with Nina. It even bleeds into the side content because there's a cheap reference to when the boss killed Mero's girlfriend in Saints Row 2. The client wants us to crush the car with the body inside. You know, to send a message. With his own monster truck. Brutal. He won't feel nothing. But the boss, of course, points out that that's simply brutal. They're better than that. Because with every reference to Saints Row, the devs want to use their new characters to make it clear they're above Saints Row 1 and 2. They're better than that. The church was dumb and so is your investment in it. It needs to be overhauled into a glossy and glitzy manner. The fleur is stupid and so is your love for it. The fucking w waffle is superior. And you like Saints Row 2? You enjoyed the boss in that game? Well, they were brutal and bad. Our new boss would never do such a horrendous thing. They're better. They're only fighting the rich capitalists, not the poor and downtrodden and would never let an innocent get caught in the way. What heroic criminals they are. The goddamn saints. And they're fucking cat. <laughs> The story of this game suffers from myriad problems. We've already discussed tone and character, but the general structure is destroyed due to the entirety of the Empire building being relegated to glorified side content. Now, the actual missions, don't get me wrong, are good, like they're well-designed missions for a Saints Row game in terms of what you're actually doing gameplay-wise. I'd take this any day in terms of gameplay and mission design over Saints Row 3's talk to a character, do three random mindless side activities, do it again. So I will give it that aspect. Again, it's the narrative and contextual elements that dismantle this story. If you would even call it a goddamn story. The game begins by establishing the boss as being an employee of Marshall, one of the three gangs in the city. Marshall is like Stag though from Saints Row 3 because, well, you've got to have a wacky over-the-top task force type corporation gang for some reason. What would a Saints Row game be without hover bikes and VTOLs? Well, it would be the most loved one, Saints Row 2, but that's beside the point. Along with the boss, we meet your three core friends, Kev, Nina, and Eli. We've already discussed how entirely bland and generic they are, so we'll skip over that bit. Nina works for the Los Panteras, a gang who, I guess, are into cars. Like, that's their thing, so I, I guess they're like the West Side Rollers, but... Also, they don't seem to have their own, like, racing scene, or like, I mean, we don't know what they do in the city, we don't understand the power balance of the city at all, and so the context of all of these gangs becomes lost. Kev is working for the Idols, which is another gang. Um, they hate capitalism, I think, and like, they take selfies in combat. I uh, that's it. And then we have Eli, a, a pussy. Uh, he's someone who has business knowledge and literally is completely not the type of person who would start a gang, always telling you killing is wrong, never wants to get his hands dirty, and actually, you know what? It was a joke the first time, but he is a fucking pussy. Now, I thought after starting the gang, we had a pretty decent setup for our three lieutenants to each have their own arc where we'd learn about them and get to learn about the gang they were connected to. It sort of writes itself. Nina leads the charge on the Lost Panteras. Kev, the idols, and Eli, with his business knowledge, is head of figuring out how to take down Marshall, the company the boss originally worked for. This makes sense, right? We'd get time with each character, and then also get cutscenes for the gangs they were in charge of to understand their current position in the city, similar to how Saints Row 1 and Saints Row 2 did it, and also nailed it. But they don't do that at all. We see the Los Panteros leader Sergio in one cutscene. And then he fucking dies. I'm not even making this up. The game doesn't ever land on a purpose. It never lands on a focus. It just meanders for its length. Things keep happening and also nothing happens at all. Wait, where have I heard this before? Stuff keeps happening, but like also nothing happens either. I'm not sure what the actual story of this game is. For most of the game, the Saints just want some money to pay off their student loans and shit. They never actually establish genuinely wanting to own the city. They dick around for so many missions. Like, why am I helping Kev get a fucking burger toy thing from not freckle bitches? What is the purpose of this? 
why is he such a fucking loser? Now we're just taking out the Lost Pantera's cars because Nina wants revenge for having her car destroyed? Maybe this will lead to something- nope. We're driving Nina around while she tries to buy art. Oh, we're destroying an idle boat? Maybe this will lead to the Saints actually aspiring to take over the city and takes things serious? Nope. We're LARPing. We're fucking LARPing. Could you imagine if Pierce or Sean D had asked Johnny Gat to go fucking LARPing in Saints Row 2? Could you imagine Julius LARPing? What is this trash volition? It's like not only are the Saints a mouthpiece for their really on-the-nose politics, they're also a mouthpiece for saying, we're really cool actually, the Saints said so. Being woke and LARPing and fucking man-children is so cool. I bet Kev writes up mini Twitter reviews for every new MCU Disney Plus show. Yeah, so this episode of She-Hulk where she twerks is totally rad. Thank you, Kevin Feige. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. There is no story to this game. There's no real running thread. They just start a gang. There's no development. They just start the gang, and then each mission is just a random thing happening that has no bearing on the next random thing happening. They never decide to focus on each gang and methodically take over the city. They never delegate. The boss never even really does any bossing. There's no structure to the story. There's no structure to the gang either. You never even feel like the saints are a real presence. The main four do everything and they always do it alone because it's usually completely unrelated to their fucking criminal enterprise anyway. On top of that, there's barely any actual cutscenes. The game is aware of how unimportant most of its missions are and they just give you an in-game piece of dialogue or a phone call. It knows it's being pointless, it doesn't even try to pretend. In Saints Row 1 and 2, you'd have a cutscene for every mission, and everyone gave you something. Characterization for the boss of the rival gang whose arc it was a part of, characterization for Troy, Dex, or Johnny, and obviously in Saints Row 2, Pierce, Sean D, and Carlos, with Gat sort of acting as your right-hand man. In this game, cutscenes are totally scarce, and when they do show up, Y your mouth doesn't fucking move, or their heads are completely missing. Who made this? The only storyline I can discern from this game is the one with the Nuali. It's just this dude who you put behind bars for Marshall at the start of the game. I don't really know who he is, he's just like a famous criminal or something. At the midpoint, after dicking around, fucking LARPing for a while, the Saints decide to pull a train heist to make some big money and finally pay off their student loans. Because they need help, for whatever reason, I'm, I'm not sure. Like, I don't even know what the Nuwali actually contributes to the mission in the end, that, like, they needed him for it, that they couldn't have just done themselves with their many gang members. But anyway, you break him out, he joins you, and he's just, like, around now, sometimes without a head. He doesn't do a lot, he just sort of hangs around in some missions, and then, like, you part ways, sort of. And I guess they build, like, a, a shallow relationship. The only thing of note that he does do is kill Sergio, which needs to happen so that we can get the ending of the game in which the Nawali, you guessed it, betrays you and says, Well, because I cannot live your life if you are still breathing. <clears throat> what does that mean? I still don't know what that means. I guess he wants the gang, but we but we see later that he has a gang, like a, a huge gang. What, why did he- After burying the boss, the boss has a vision, one which plays on insecurities about not being able to help your friends, not being tough enough to kill the bad guy. You do not have what it takes. When the real bad guys show up to play, I'm going to kill the bad guy this time. And to be honest, what the fuck? The moment where Sergio is killed isn't played like this important character moment that sows seeds of doubt. In fact, it's never brought up again and the boss goes back to being the boss. But at the end, for some reason, the game tries to like gaslight you into thinking there was an arc or depth or substance and I'm losing my mind over this. There is nothing here but the game is trying to pretend there fucking is. Volition, you cannot fool me. You didn't write any actual material here. You're completing an arc that didn't exist for the length of the game. Are you kidding me? A lot of the writing in this game feels like it conflicts with itself. It feels like there was 10 different writers and none of them actually spoke to each other because you get scenes like this and then you get scenes like this and they're like moments apart from each other. This isn't tonally or thematically solid, it's the complete opposite. It's entirely tumultuous. The last mission I feel extenuates this more than any other part of the game. You can summarise this game's writing problems in this one mission alone, so let me just zip through these events in order. You're celebrating your success, and then the Nawali betrays you, buries you alive in maybe the closest thing to Saints Row 2 in this game, then right after this very Saints Row scene, it throws you into a fucking dream world where you're on a board game about animals that the main characters played in a cutscene one time, and we're meant to believe this carries emotional significance to the plot. After breaking free from the dream with the help of a 
the random fucking cat that we see all of twice in the game in the background of cutscenes, we walk through the Saints HQ where all of our gang members have been slaughtered, which again is complete tonal whiplash. <laughs> We then drive to get weapons in which the boss, knowing her friends are captured, calls all of them individually and leaves them voice messages saying that she's coming to save them, so they can pretend to show character through the most vapid of interactions. Not even interactions, actually, she's speaking to nobody. After getting the weapons, you drive to the place where you first face the Nawali, listening to Eli's obnoxious fucking self-help podcast. In a corporate machine. Did they you think this will come across as satisfying, or at this point, had they done, like, degree. so many jokes that they were just like, well, the game is a joke. Like, we can't have a cathartic, satisfying conclusion to a, to a meaningful story. Like, no, no, no. Everything is a joke. Even the game itself is a joke. Once you're there, you fight a shit ton of guys. Like I said before, he has a huge gang. Why is he even doing this in the first place? We're treated to this cringe fucking scene. I've had a long fucking day. Can we... Can we please be reasonable people? I can. You're gonna say you can't tell me because the Nawali will kill you. Then I'll say... If you don't tell me, I'll kill you. We're just gonna be right back to where we started, so let's just skip that part. No, I was gonna say I can put the address in your phone. Oh. Uh, yeah, no. <clears throat> That'd be super helpful. Fucking Christ. You mind unlocking it? Oops, sorry oh about that. Oh my god, mm. this is so great. You're a fucking maniac. Well, you know, I have a lot of practice and pent up rage. Then we steal the VTOL. Fuck's sake, not again. Fly to the casino and blow shit up, storm our way in. Holy shit, are we mic'd? No. This is something else. How do you know that? I, it's our roommate, isn't it? They're here to say- uh, uh, Save you! <laughs> the game pulls a my friends and my power moment like this is fucking Kingdom Hearts. We head to the roof where the boss and the Nuali square off in what I can only assume is a reference to the end of the good, the bad, and the ugly. I hate movie references. I think it's cheap comedy to use scenes from a famous movie and call it parody. It's just using a movie scene. Clever parody has to make fun of the source material, poke fun at it whether the narrative or the filmmaking for comedic effect. Just using a scene from a movie in something else isn't parody, it's just using a scene from a movie in another thing. We win the fight and then they rip off the ending of Saints Row 2 without fucking earning it. You ruined everything. Oh my god, they literally did- oh my god. They literally did rip off Saints Row 2. They literally ripped off Saints Row 2, but they didn't earn an ounce of it. They didn't earn a fucking ounce of it. Fuck off. And that's the end of the main story. They look out onto the city the same as the end of Saints Row 2, but like, did they really achieve anything? Los Panteras was taken out by the Nuali. The idols just still exist, and so does Marshall. We just killed the leader guy, but he handed the company over to someone else anyway. We just did a load of bullshit, and they just act triumphant. They don't even own the city. The characters didn't even have an arc. Nothing fucking happened. Why is this game gaslighting me into thinking something happened after an hour of tonal whiplash? I'm absolutely completely baffled that, that this exists. It's an exercise in some of the worst writing I've ever seen from a product. I made a critique on the Obi-Wan show a few months back, and this makes that look like a bloody masterpiece. Everything I have written in the script that I've recorded up until this point in the video was before I played the final mission, the secret ending, if you will, called Best Friends Forever. Over the course of Saints Row, the protagonist and the other main characters in the game, Kevin, Nina and Eli, reference continuously that they really, really want to go karaoke, right? Which, okay, I guess. I I don't know why you would want the Saints to go and do karaoke in the first place. I spent a very long time grinding money because the final, the final mission is locked behind a barrier, buying every venture. And when you get to the end, ventures start costing $1.6 million, which you don't accumulate quickly at that point. You have to buy three of those. That took me 24 hours of leaving my PC on to grind money, getting up in the night every three hours to take the money out of the bank account in game and and then let it accumulate again. I had sleepless nights to get this fucking ending. Then, after all of that, you have to build the Saints Tower, which costs eight 
million dollars. I could only accumulate 3.5 million every four hours. So you can imagine what the hell that was like. All to get the final ending, which I assumed would put a cap on the end of the game, would 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 summarize everything, would bring everything together, and would would give some sort of satisfying conclusion to these characters. But instead, but instead I got this. If you see a faded sign at the side of the road that says 15 miles to the... the shack. They do, th they do the whole song. The whole song. And this happens. Enough outside just to get down. And this. And I. And I. <laughs> hey, what? Somebody, a group of people had to, had to, had to storyboard it, write it out. Animate the whole thing, voice act it, and at no point during that process did anyone think maybe, maybe no. There is no satisfying cap on Saints Row. There is no conclusion to this game. There is simply an awfully choreographed, terribly put together, cringy karaoke sequence with these terrible characters we've come to know over the course of the game to end a story that made absolutely no sense that gaslit you into believing there was anything meaningful going on in the 11th hour and then it just ends out of nowhere the side content is completely disconnected from the main story the main story has nothing to say no story to tell overall i feel sad because i played the whole fucking thing and I'm glad I, I wrote most of the script prior to playing that final mission, because it would have definitely tampered with my view of the game. Because right now, I am so... I don't know the word. Just disappointed. Just upset. Let down. Confused. Because it ends on a note that is so vapid more than anything else in the entire game that I just feel pretty empty to be honest. I can't now look at the look at the, the the empire building system and go, yeah, there's fun to be had there because the because it ends in a it, because, Jesus fucking Christ. I'm blown away mainly at the arrogance that they genuinely felt they earned a dance party ending, like they're up there with the greatest pieces of cinema of all time. Toy Story 2, Jojo Rabbit, fucking Shrek. This, along with everything else I've discussed in this video, is so far from what made Saints Row big in the first place. I'm disappointed that Volition and Deep Silver don't see the merit in Saints Row 1 and 2. I'm confused at how they twisted what was an attempt to recapture Saints Row 3, a game I don't even think is that good, and somehow made it worse. This game is a joke. It's garbage. Despite the few positives I listed at the top of the video, this game doesn't deserve your time, your money, or your respect. It isn't deserving of the Saints Row name. It's an absolute embarrassment made by out-of-touch developers trying to create something that is so sanitized to the point it pleases almost nobody but the lowest common denominator. And if that offends you, I, I don't know, get, get fucked? <laughs> I expected this game to suck. I went in hoping to have my mind changed, honestly wishing to have my mind changed because I miss Saints Row. I loved Saints Row, and this is an absolute goddamn insult. By the way, a big thank you to Volition and Deep Silver for providing me with a review code. You, you're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Now, if you're interested in critical thinking and analysis, two things I think are incredibly important when producing content like this, consider checking out the sponsor of this video, Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and an app that lets you learn and engage with all kinds of interesting concepts, from math and science to foundational logic and statistics and finance. They teach you through interactivity. I've only been using it for a little while, but some of the lessons in logic have not only been fun, they've been incredibly engaging. It's nice to have a bite-sized puzzle to run through every
every day or as often as you want. I find this specifically helpful when training your brain to think more critically and logically. And with the type of writing I do here on YouTube, it's definitely nice to keep your brain ticking away. No matter the field you choose, of which there are plenty, there are always basic to more advanced lessons. So Brilliant can be used by newcomers and by veterans in these subjects and always be helpful to learn new skills. To get started for free, visit brilliant.org forward slash lasers or hit the link down in the description. The first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So if you're interested, head down to the description, click the link and get started with Brilliant today. Seriously though, Thank you for, I don't know what that was. I don't know what I did. That... Ever since the Horizon Forbidden West video that I made a couple months ago, I've sort of changed the way I make content because I had so much fun making that video. And I think it made me realize that not everything I do needs to sort of conform to this very rigid set of rules that I, I guess, thought my content was. I don't know if that makes any sense. I guess being able to make shorter videos, even longer videos potentially in the future, things on different subjects, come at things from different angles, really find a core focus for a video too, and throw a bit more personality in there as well, has been cathartic, it's been nice, and I think this video was, this this was fun to make, this, none of this video was ever a chore, ever felt like a job, I just had a blast from start to finish working on this, not so much fun playing the game, I will say that, that was, um, yeah, roller coaster. But one that just goes down. Um, <laughs> you know. But I do hope that you had fun with it. Because I had a lot of fun working on it. If you haven't already checked out my Saints Row retrospective. Go give it a watch. I'm sure if you enjoyed this video you'd enjoy that video. And if you came from that video. Thank you. I hope you liked them both. I've got a few other major projects coming this year. One of them being a big retrospective on Assassin's Creed 1 for the 15th anniversary. Um, which I'm going to put my all into. If you know me, you know I absolutely fucking love the first Assassin's Creed. And I'm going to make sure everyone else can appreciate it in the same way. Um, with a video that really does it justice. I might do a video on The Witcher 1. I don't know if I'm going to be able to squeeze it in. But I'm going to try and get that out in October. And then get the Assassin's Creed 1 video out in November. Um, and I also have another video coming out end of this month on Subnautica Below Zero. Bit of a smaller one. Um, but a follow up to my Subnautica video nonetheless. Uh, which should be pretty fun too. Anyway, that's it from me. I won't keep you any longer. Uh, don't forget to follow me on social media if you want to stay up to date on what I'm doing, my takes on things that I don't necessarily post on YouTube, and uh, updates for future videos. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram. Those links are both in the description. I also have a second channel where I post more low effort stuff. I compile down stream series into shorter videos so you can see my entire time with a particular video game. Currently, I'm, I'm going through all the Final Fantasy, so if you're interested in that, that is there, as well as uh, condensed videos of like stream clips where like I have a take on something if someone asks me about like a new game trailer or a, a new piece of news or whatever and I throw a take out there I'll edit that down into like a short little sort of low effort video and throw it up on its last boy so that's in the description too and as well if you want to join me live in the future to have a chat and things then you can the link in the description to my twitch where I stream very frequently so I'd love to have you over there for a little chat to be part of the community it'd be really really nice and with that I am done I will see you all soon for this Nautica video I uh, hope you have a nice day, evening, night, morning, wherever the fuck you are in the world. Um, and I appreciate you for tuning in. Anyway, thank you very much, and I will see you later on. Bye-bye.